grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's stand as we're able now as we sing hymn number 888, O Beautiful for Spacious Sky. reading from the first book of John. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And this is the testimony God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
As we come to the end of our six-week reflection on John's first sermon, I appreciate more and more how simple and yet profound John's theology is. We love God when we practice loving others. And it is in this practice of loving others that we know God's love. You know, I've had many people tell me over the years that they believe in God, they believe in the Ten Commandments, but they are uninterested in being an active part of a church. I get it. Being part of a church can be frustrating as the reality of our communal life together always falls way short of our ideal. These uh, friends often justify themselves by saying something like, well, I don't need to be in church to pray. I find God in nature or someplace else. Besides, I know I'm forgiven, so I don't need to go to church in order to receive it. There are probably about a hundred variations of this reasoning that I have heard and I'm often at a loss for how to respond adequately. Because, in a way, they're not wrong. But John offers a very simple and profound answer to this logic. Faith is about relationships, not logic. If salvation according to John, is fellowship with God and each other, you can't say that you love God and not love the people that are right in front of you. If going to church is simply about whether or not it satisfies some perceived need in yourself or whether or not God will still love you, then no. You do not need to go to church. But John does not define going to church as something you do or you don't do for your own personal, individual benefit. Worship, being fully present with God and with each other, is simply who we are. It's a part of our identity. It is our true identity, as a matter of fact. Not something that's on our to-do list or our not-to-do list. From a relational perspective, it makes no sense to be a believer in Christ and not be an active part of the body of Christ. It would be like being a dentist who doesn't see patients. Or a salesperson who doesn't want any customers. Or being a parent, but I don't want to see my You get the idea. And one thing I have learned from studying John's sermon more in depth over these past six weeks is receiving God's love is never solely an individual endeavor. We come to worship in order to receive this love together as a community. God's love and our joy, John says, is made complete in us, in our imperfect fellowship. And likewise, forgiveness is known in and through the whole community. Love and forgiveness are not some transactions that we deal with God alone, but essential practices and disciplines in maintaining and growing complex living relationships with God and with each other. So today, we heard the end of John's sermon. It's a beautiful ending, encapsulating everything John has been trying to tell us. You heard it, and this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know you have eternal life. 
And we want to say amen to that. But we need to make sure that we hear this in the context in which John wrote it. John earlier had said, Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous. So John is not making exclusive claims that salvation is reserved only for Christians, forsaking God's love for billions of people who have grown up in other faith traditions. The word that we translate simply as has actually has deeper connotations. It means to put on, to wear like clothing. John is saying whoever puts on the unconditional love given to us in the Son of God and wears it around, lives in it like you're in your favorite pair of jeans, is truly living the eternal life. So other faiths, or people who have grown skeptical of all faiths, they may still be putting on this love. John would say that they too have the Son of God if they're striving to practice a more loving life. John himself certainly is not worried about other faith traditions. He's clearly worried in this sermon about Christians misunderstanding their own faith. So, this is the perfect ending to John's sermon. It speaks powerfully to us today, 2,000 years later. The problem is, and I don't know if any of you caught this already, Despite the lectionary encouraging us to stop here, and Tanya and I noted how short that lesson was, right? It wasn't because, oh, we've kind of gone on long enough, we should cut this off. No, they purposefully left off the last eight verses. Not a lot more to read, but that's where John should have ended his sermon, or so we think. Here's the next eight verses, and you'll understand why we didn't read them <laughs> in church. And this is the boldness we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have obtained the requests made of him. If you see your brother or sister committing what is not a deadly sin, you will ask and God will give life to such a one, to those whose sin is not deadly. There is sin that is deadly. I do not say that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that is not deadly. We know that those who are born of God do not sin, but the one who is born of God protects them, and the evil one does not touch them. We know that we are God's children, and the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. In his son Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children keep yourselves from idols. That's it. The end. No amen. Now. I was thinking. If John. Were an intern pastor working with us. I would sit them down and say, what in the world are you doing? That is a horrible choice to end your sermon that way. You should have ended it eight verses earlier. It's a cardinal rule in preaching that you never introduce a new topic at the end of your sermon. And yet, out of nowhere, John starts talking about deadly sins and idolatry, and unlike all the other spiritual words in which he helps us define and gives context and meaning and depth to, he says nothing to help us understand what in the world is he talking about? What is it? There are some that are deadly sins, but there are some that are not. Okay, go for it and do not deadly sin. Now, typically, 
most people assume that its meaning was obvious to John and his audience at the time, and has simply just been lost to us in history. So we just have to guess at what he might mean by deadly sin. Our best guess is that it refers to people who simply don't care about caring for others. They know that they're being selfish. They know that they are hurting people in order to get what they want. And they don't care. They embrace their wickedness and may even call it an attribute. Paul describes them as enemies of the cross of Christ. Cross of Christ, not Chris. Cross of Christ, whose destiny is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. John, earlier, in another part of the sermon that our lectionary also happened to choose to skip over, I wonder why, calls them antichrist. That is, literally embodying the opposite of Christ's life and love. This reminds me of when Jesus said to his disciples, do not cast your pearls before swine. John says in his own way, don't pray about sins that lead to death. You don't need to worry about that. The answer, John tells us at the end of his sermon, for people who are only thinking about themselves and have no interest in caring about others, is not to try to get them to see the error of their ways. The answer, certainly, is not to try to make people feel guilty, to put conditions on the unconditional love that we have received. Rather, the answer is simply to embrace this love of God and practice loving others as much as we possibly can ourselves. John's answer is for us to never stop caring about others ourselves. Now, you might notice upon further reflection John turns his sermon quickly from a focus on others and their sins back to a focus on ourselves and our own struggle to remain faithful. He wrote, We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one born of God keeps them safe. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. What initially sounded like an abrupt, random ending is really a call to listen to Jesus when he says, take the log out of your own eye before you try to take the speck out of your neighbor's. So the question we need to ask ourselves when someone shares their justifications for why they don't participate in church anymore is not, what is the best answer that I can give which will convince them that they are wrong? You know, pastor gave a sermon and he said, relationally, you're stupid. That's not a good answer to, to hand back, right? But very simply and profoundly, asking ourselves, what do I have to learn from that? And, by the way, not to automatically treat them as if somehow they're so selfish that there's no, of every single person that has ever said this to me, hundreds of people have said this to me, every single one I know cares and loves deeply and wants to be more loved, just like me. So don't treat them like they've somehow committed some sort of deadly sin. They're not. As I said earlier, after 25 years of being a pastor, I'm just now beginning to appreciate more, more fully in this study, in this last six weeks, how much my faith is not my own alone, but part of a shared journey of the whole community in which I live. And my understanding
understanding of this community to which I belong keeps expanding. This is not just a shared journey of those who choose to be active in our church. But it's not a shared journey of those who actually think like I do. But of everyone that I know and love, of everyone that I meet out in the community right here. It seems obvious now, but I truly did not realize how much I was buying into the extreme individualism and idolatry of our society myself. Like I thought my faith was mine alone. I let this individualism infect how I was thinking about faith. John tells us very clearly, very simply, that we love God when we practice loving others. John did not say, practice loving others who agree with you. Practice loving others who belong to this same community. It is in this practice of loving others that we know God's love. And the more I keep reflecting on this ending, the more I keep coming back to how simple and profound it really is. And contrary to the absolute number one rule I learned about preaching, it's the perfect ending because it's also a new beginning for all of us. Now, I wanted to come up with some random new topic to bring up to end my sermon, but I just couldn't, so. Um, let's reflect on this God word, God's word in our own life as we sing our hymn of the day, hymn number 632, Oh God, our help in ages past.
have so many prayer concerns that we are grateful to know that you are always aware and attentive to our needs. We can trust that you always respond, even when it is difficult to pray. Only you know our real needs, Lord. And so we turn the unknown of our worries, fears, and anxieties over to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of our lives, as we complete this holiday weekend celebrating independence, may your spirit guide us to always honor and respect the responsibility and blessings of such liberty. May we always fight for justice in the world, in our, in our local communities, so that all may live value and with the ability to care for themselves and others. Lord, may we remember that we do not walk through this life alone. You walk with us, and we walk with each other. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of our lives, we ask you to bless the lives of our faith family members in need of healing and wise, skilled medical care. Be with Anne, Jenny, Alta, Donald, Lee, and Claudia. Many other friends and family also need your gracious comfort and healing. Bless especially Mike, Zach, Barb, Lyle, Kate, Daryl, Carolyn, Patty, Betty, Bill, Gary, Johan, Jim, John, Sophie, and Cheryl as they heal and recover. We also ask for guidance in providing care and comfort to those in our midst who grieve the death of a loved one, whether long ago or more recently. Help us to join you in encouraging support of the families of Chuck, Bob, Judy, and John. May they know your ever-present comfort. Lord, in your mercy, hear us. Lord of our lives, as our youth and families prepare for the pilgrimage to the EOCA Youth Gathering, we pray that your Spirit will guide them to enthusiastically and joyfully share this time of reflection, service, and learning. May they return to us prepared and eager to share with us and live powerfully in your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Now let's stand as we are able as a sign that we offer our whole selves for service in God's kingdom along with our offering. Singing hymn number 205, Thankful Hearts and Voices and Words. Notice that's also a new tune for this offering song.
that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join your unending hymn.
May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in His grace. Amen. Now please stand as you're able as we uh, sing God's word going and follow the light of Christ out into the world. Singing hymn 890, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Lord. 